Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. What a delight it is every time we are here. Cheryl and I thank you for the privilege of being with you today. And we have been grateful every time we've been together to worship in this congregation. What a blessing it is to be with you during the week when I get to see different ones of you and then on Sunday. And I thank you for your worship. Beautiful service, beautiful organ music, your singing, the choir, uh, all of this together. Rich worship experience and beautiful worship setting. And I appreciate that so very much and your commitment to it and devotion to it. We're glad to be here with you. I was I was even happier to be here when I checked the weather report in Minneapolis, Minnesota this morning. <laughs> Once you see what's happening there, this is really a beautiful day outside, and we're really doing great and uh, have no problem. So uh, Excited to be with you. It's great to look at and see Jay and Kay Harris here. Dr. Jay Harris is, they are not strangers to worshiping here. Jay is the director of ministerial services for our annual conference, and so I'm very grateful for that. And appreciate so many, all the connections that we have that are part of uh, the life of our annual conference uh, when we are together here. And I think I'm grateful to Anthony. What a delightful person he is to work with. I just keep working with him. If I could just get him to come out of his shell and show a little enthusiasm sometimes. <laughs> Anthony, thank you. Uh, one, of the, one of my mentors used to talk about the fact that um, uh, he appreciated people who, who preach like it matters. And you take all of this seriously. From the administration, the prayer, the worship, the preaching, the teaching, it does matter. And that is a glory to God. And I thank you for that. Now, it's great to be with you during the Epiphany season, this interesting season between Christmas and about 10 days from now, Ash Wednesday, and the Lenten season starts. Uh, Epiphany is a word that means to reveal, to uncover, to let the light shine. It's the season we think of the, it's ushered in by the wise men arriving, the, the, the light of the star, guys in the Christ. That's a, the key symbol for Epiphany, the Gentile. The world represented by the wise men and Gentiles coming to Jesus and by the light that God guided them. And all throughout the epiphany season, one thinks of epiphanies, revelations that we have, the times that we see the light, so that we become aware that the light of the world really has come. So it's a very important season. Now, the passage that was read, thank you for reading it in such a great way, is very special to me because uh, John 2, 1 through 11 is another one of those key passages historically for the Epiphany season. It is the story of Jesus' first miracle, and as you've heard it being read, perhaps you remember that Jesus was in Cana of Galilee, had a chance to be there just a few weeks ago with about 90 members of the South Georgia Conference, and we were there, and the church has been built over that spot. We remember Jesus turning water into wine at the wedding feast uh, in Cana of Galilee. It's in the, uh, one of the key uh, passages and themes and stories of the Epiphany season. And I've run into a lot of people over the years for whom this is a, a delightful passage. They love it. They appreciate it. Do you know that for many, many years, a decade or longer after I got out of seminary, I was not among those who loved it. Now maybe you are. I, I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm just saying I had a very hard time with this passage. Because it's the first miracle of Jesus. And I thought, Lord, I'm no marketing guru. But I mean, for your first miracle? Wouldn't this be a good time to open the eyes of the blind? Uh, make the lame walk. Feed 5,000 and get some media coverage. <laughs> but really, in a little tiny, little, little, little back of the, out of the way place like Cana, at a wedding reception, and you launch your public ministry, this is your first miracle. I mean, and truly, I'm not making this up. I had this visceral reaction like, Everything about this is wrong. No. This is not the way to get started. It's the very first miracle. 
And so the problem for me is that in the Christian lectionary, the cycle of readings that uh, keep us going through the Bible and that I study regularly, uh, that many, many pastors do, this story, if you read through the Bible over a three-year period, this story comes around uh, in Epiphany every third year. And every time it would come around, I would dodge it. Have you ever dodged the Bible verse? I would dodge it. I would see it coming. And I'd say, okay, better get out of the way. It's Epiphany, and I see the headlights coming at me here. That better move. And I just would feel led to preach on the Old Testament lesson or the New Testament lesson, but not the gospel. Because I just thought, what are you going to say about this? My congregation is full of people who deal with life's problems and, and they come in weary at the end of the week. And I'm going to say, Jesus turned water into wine. Go have a good day. What do you think to go with? And I, I wrestled with it. And finally, after 10 years or more, I said to myself, I can't have a part of the Bible that I never preach on. That's just not right for me. So I, I put money out. I plan my preaching a year ahead of time. And so that doesn't mean I don't change it, but I do plan. And so I said, hey, when that comes around, I'm going to preach on that passage. And this will give the Lord a whole year to get me ready. <laughs> and so the week came. I'd been reading it. I'd been studying it. I'd been dreading it. And I thought maybe the heavens will open, the devil will sin, the message will come. It didn't. And now it's Wednesday before Sunday at the church office call. They always put the title of the sermon on the sign out front. You know what I'm talking about? Where you have that sign. Where they said to me, what's the title of your sermon? And I thought to myself, if I had it, do you think I wouldn't have called you? <laughs> I don't know what it is. I don't, I don't, I don't. And so I sat back in my chair and I said, well, Lord, this passage has come true in my life today. My homiletical wine has run out. I have nothing to say because I just don't connect with this passage. And I can't fake it. It wouldn't be right to do that. I can say the things you're supposed to say. I read it out of books and commentaries and have notes and let's talk. But, but, but the heart's not there for me. And as I slumped back in my chair, I felt the Lord saying to me, Well, you finally got it. I said, What? And the Lord said, In ministry, the wine is always running out. And you don't like that. You like to operate on full all the time. And you know, it's true. I mean, when my gas tank gets to half, guess what I do? I fill up. Did anybody else do that? When I get to half, because I won't be on the floor. Because for me, running out of stuff is something that should never happen because you knew ahead of time, why would you let yourself run out? Whether it's paper towels in the kitchen or gas, whatever it is. Did you not know you got a gas? You just tell it. Now, my strikingly beautiful spouse has a different approach. <laughs> I noticed when we were dating, this goes back 40 years now, I would get into my car, I'm on full. When we got into her car, it was always on empty. <laughs> I casually mentioned this. This is not good to do when you're dating, but I casually mentioned this. And her response would, would be to take a dating little handkerchief and cover the gas gauge with it. <laughs> and then she would say to me, as long as you can't see it, you'll never run out. <laughs> I didn't know that, that I, didn't, I had never been introduced to that understanding of how, how gasoline works in the automobile. But you know it never ran out for her? I think she has more faith than I did. But what this passage had done, what the Lord was revealing to me is, your negative response to this passage is not a problem with the Scripture. It's a spiritual problem. Big learning experience for me that some, but sometimes a reason I don't like a Bible verse or have a negative or want to dodge it may be telling me more about me than it does about the Bible. And what that wrestling match with God revealed to me about this passage with all those years, the reason I have not liked it is it's about running out. And I don't want to run out. I want to be at the top of my game every day, don't you? I want to be on full. I want to know at the beginning of the year that we have not only the budget pledged, but all the money in. I want to know there's always going to be enough teachers and enough people, enough people to care for the building and serve in different I want to know that. 
And the idea that things are always running out was a huge learning part, part of the ministry for me. And that's why the Lord used that to teach me. In ministry, it will always appear there's not going to be enough. That the line is running out. The Lord said, it, 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 your other problem is you want to be the one who turns water into wine. Wave the magic wine, man. Solve all those needs and those concerns and make them work out. But you can't turn water into wine, the Lord said, and that really ticks you off with this passage. Can you see what a scathing, searching, spiritual inventory that was for me? And the Lord said, if, if you can't deal with the fact that it's always going to appear that the wine's running out, you better go do something else. Because welcome to ministry. You're always pouring yourself out. It never seems there's going to be done. Then I think historically, over 2,000 years, as Christians have been beaten and bruised and persecuted and uh, rejected by society, it always looked like the church wasn't going to make it to the next generation. And then Jesus said to me, and the only way it happens is that I turn water into wine. Nobody else can take credit for it. Deal with that, preacher. Then you can stay in the movement here. <coughs> oh, he had one last word for me too, though. And by the way, if you want to be, you do have a role to play. He said, did you notice in the story that when they drew the water out and took it to the master's ceremonies and he drank it, he said that you can't help but chuckle that part about it. I mean, just a little interesting, interesting to, to insight into anthropologically into wedding customs in that day. You say the good minds are last. Nobody does that. You give them the good stuff at first. They get drunk. Then you bring out the cheap stuff. That's interesting. But then Jesus said, "Did you notice that nobody knew how the water turned into wine? Did you notice except who? The servants. The servants." And then Jesus said, well, you know, they were the ones who really knew everything had gone on because they poured the water. And then the Lord said, that's your role. If you don't think you see enough miracles, if you think you need to see them happening, if you think it's not vibrant enough, not alive enough, you worry about everything running out, your job that, 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 you, that you can choose to accept is that of the servant who pours the water. Because that's when the miracle began. I can't turn the water into wine. What he taught me was, I can't pour water. <laughs> and pouring water, pouring water, pouring water are the things I can do. I think of, of uh, uh, Evelyn Mullen at First Methodist Church in uh, Dublin, Alabama. Elderly lady, when I was her pastor, she'd been a truant officer in school. You know how long it's been since truant officers were hammering? That tells you about her age. But you know what? Every young adult in that church knew her. You know why? Because when she was very advanced in years, whenever a child was born, she gave a monetary gift to the church in the name of that child, and the family got the notification. Then they would come in on Sunday morning and say to me, I want to meet that lady. Every young adult in church knew her because the kid had remembered by her. She poured the water. Went, it's pouring the water. It's about, it's about the servant mentality. The problem I had was the water into wine mentality. And Jesus said to me, that's never going to work for you, buddy. But you could be a servant. You could pour the water. So I was on a plane uh, flying uh, from to Washington, D.C., so the fellow was sitting beside me, we got to start, we started talking, and he'd been in Alabama because he worked with water systems, and he'd been uh, working on a water system there, and we got to talking, and uh, I said, well, water, that's interesting, because I just got back from taking a medical mission team to the Republic of Panama, we worked in a rainforest area, we discovered that they have a problem with sanitary water, so we'd like to build a water well for them and have something sanitary there, and then we, the plane lands in Washington, Dulles Airport, I think, and you go out and put walk off the plane. I don't even know his name at this point. He said, would you stay here just a minute? He said, well, what are you talking about? There's an ATM over there. I want to get some money and give it to you to help drill that well y'all are talking about doing. I didn't realize that a conversation on an airplane can be poured in water. I don't even know. I still don't know. To this day, I don't know his name. He came back 
in the ATM, he gave me two hundred dollars. He doesn't know me. He doesn't even know if that's a true story. May have been a new half of Cheryl, but I wanted you don't know. <laughs> the next Sunday, I had shared, I preached on this passage at First Methodist to Dothan, and I shared. He just on the plane, gave me this two hundred dollars to keep people in the water. He wants us to. to have a well for the folks up in the area of Panama. And after the, after the passage of the service was over, Steve McCarroll came to me and said, he wrote, he wrote on, the, on the offering envelope, he wrote down, this is too good to stop. And he had $200 in there. And I shared that with the congregation. And more started coming in. We formed the Water into Wine Club. And a few weeks later, there was $10,000 that had come in about 200 bucks at a time. From somebody whose name I still don't know because we poured the water on the airplane. Being a servant is a whole different way of looking at ministry. It's about not, yes, yes, it, it's not pretending that things don't look bleak. The water, to me, the wine, the wine's always running out. Now, now I understand. That's why it's Jesus' first miracle. Because in the very beginning, he said, deal with this, get this straight, get comfortable with the fact that it's never going to look like a roaring success to you. The wine's always going to appear to be running out. You can't turn water into wine. That's going to take you off. And I can't. Pour the water. Pour the water. Pour the water. Whenever you think there's not enough, whenever you think things are going down the drain, whenever you find yourself worried in trouble, go find some water and pour it. That's when, that's when you get to see miracles. People who pour the water. And they, 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 there may be miracles of all kinds as you do that. Now, so... I want to thank you for your congregation. You, you, you pour the water, but you put up that, that nativity scene during Christmas that you do. Is that what they are? Is that Holy Week? That you do all kinds of things like that where you pour the water. When it's cherry blossom time, you're out here with cherry blossoms and paint people's car and all that. You do cherry. And, and during the week, do you realize how many community groups come and meet in this building? Because you welcome them in. That's pouring the water. In those individual wonderful ways that you can pour the water. The um, one one day I got tired of riding by all the AME, AME Zion, C M E, Hispanic, Korean, uh, United Methodist churches, and I just said, Lord, I, I want us all to be together for witness for Christ. And the Holy Spirit said to me, Why don't you call that? Part? And all I did was get us together for lunch. And out of that came a pan Methodist Pentecost service and lit services together among all the congregation. I had no idea where that would go. But I'm trying to learn more and more that my primary role is servant who pours the water. And that when I'm pouring water, I worry less about everything else. Let Jesus turn it into wine. <laughs> I went, uh, Anthony, Anthony, be sure to go to all the district meetings you can because you never can tell what's going I went to one in the Mobile area when I was serving down there. <coughs> and it was in Sarah Land outside of Mobile. And I walked in and it was at night time and tired already. So I go in and I'm getting my packet information, I'm getting my name tag, and I'm looking for the coffee. And there it is down there. They have it all set up. I got the coffee and, uh, and I, I looked around the and I said, Do you have any sugar? And those adults, Standing there doing hospitality, looking at each other like I had asked a ten million dollar question. That deer in the head like sugar. And everybody froze. Walking around, they just all froze. And this one little kid was standing there about nine or ten years old. And after everybody was sitting there in utter shock, he diagnosed the situation and spoke up and said to me, They ain't got none. <laughs> Then he said, but I know where to get some. <laughs> and he ran to the kitchen. <laughs> he was probably rubbing you through that kitchen while they were in church all the time. He knew right where the sugar was. He came right back with it. And he got me what I knew. Is that the servant role Christ Church might have today? In a world where it can look like the love is running out, the patience is running out, the tolerance is running out, the hope is running out. Is it our job to stand with that nine-year-old and say, stop looking for it in the wrong places. They ain't got none. But I know where to get some. And then we pour the water. And let Jesus decide what kind of wine it needs to wear. But it will always be the best. Let us pray.
merciful God. We bless you for this amazing story of servants who poured the water and participated in the miracle that you brought about. We want to be those kind of servants. Help us to discover ways that we can each pour the water in our own unique setting, in our own way, with our own resources. We want to pour the water so that the light of your presence may shine forth in the wine that emerges each time we do it. In Christ's name we pray.